Also, if you uh, would like us to handle stock transfers, uh, gifts of appreciated property, some of those kinds of things, you can reach out to me uh, for that. Um, on the next slide, we're going to introduce uh, Cassandra. Um, and uh, I'll let her introduce herself a little bit later for those of you who haven't, uh, who haven't met her. But Cassandra and, and Taylor are really your nuts and bolts. You don't want to ask me any questions about the grant application because I really don't know. <laughs> um, but Cassandra and Taylor uh, do. And that I think is, is probably the best, uh, the best way to, uh, to, work with, to work with them. As a, in, within the Community Foundation, Cassandra really is your point person. She is the one who works with all of our agencies, all of our nonprofits. Whether you have an, an, a, a fund with us or not, it doesn't matter. Um, she is going to be your, your point person, uh, which I think is, is, is really important to us that you all have someone specifically that you can call on. Uh, if she doesn't know the answer, you bet she will get it. Um, so I think that would uh, that be, be helpful. And the other thing that's helpful is that if you, if you're, before you even apply, if you want to run an idea by her, now I don't need everybody running ideas by her because some of you already know what you're doing, but if there's something you're not quite sure whether it fits, um, you can also reach out to Cassandra as well um, on that. So you'll hear, you'll hear the rest of the program from Cassandra, actually. <laughs> so practically, I'm just going to just run over the um, agenda for today. Um, and that we've already done the welcome and introductions. I'm going to give you a quick update on the foundation. And then I'll turn it over to Cassandra to really talk about uh, the grants process, um, some ideas for a successful application, the online application form, and then uh, we'll have time for a Q&A uh, for all of you um, as well. So I want to just give you a quick update on the, uh, on the Community Foundation. Um, and for those of you who are relatively new to our work, um, we are now in our 22nd year of serving San Luis Obispo County. We give somewhere between two and five million dollars uh, out a year um, to um, about 95% of our funding stays in county. Um, and so uh, we, we have about a quarter million dollars in scholarships uh, that we award every year as well. Um, so the um, important aspect in terms of our work is that there are, um, we are really a, a source for bringing together people who care with people who are doing really good work with community need. And so I think that is, uh, that's really, that's really important. I think we need to advance the slide a little bit. There we go. Thank you. Um, and uh, just so you know, the Community Foundation now has charitable assets of over $60 million. Um, and uh, which is a very significant number for a foundation in a community with less than 300,000 people. But we take our grant making um, and our application process review evaluation uh, very seriously. We're part of a, um, both a statewide as well as a national association of community foundations. So we really utilize the best practices um, from, on, from the other uh, community foundations that we uh, share professional uh, accreditation uh, with as well. So I think, that's, uh, I think that's important for you to know. And we are here to help you because you help everybody on the ground. And I think that's really uh, important um, for the, the role of our foundation, right? We're not here to judge your program, but we are here to help as an asset. So grant making and education are the two main pillars of our work. Um, and we work with lots of charitable folks, just like we look, you know, work with um, all of you from the nonprofit uh, side. A couple things that are important for you to think about. That's our building, by the way, just in case um, for you all. Someday we'll be back there and someday we'll have our meeting back there and it'll be fun. But that's, that's where we are on Dana Street. Um, so the Community Foundation in the last couple of years has stepped into the funding collaborative. Uh, space, and that means that we are bringing together other funders. Um, a good example of this um, is the, the funds we received from Robert Wood Johnson to be able to put into our disaster support fund, uh, PG&E also. So there's a lot of opportunities that outside funders are utilizing the Community Foundation for so that we can maximize impact and support for, for you all. 
You hear a lot about donor advised funds. We have quite a few donor advised funds with us um, as well. So we, with, through the general grants program, when you apply to the general grants program, we also take a look uh, in some cases at the applications. And if we know of some of the donors on the donor advised side, we will bring your idea to them. So some of you have just received grants from the foundation kind of over the transom. You didn't apply for it, you don't know who these people are, et cetera, but that's what happens is that we are an advocate for you, for donors who are interested, if they're interested in your particular area. We do not accept unsolicited um, applications for our donor advice funds. So please don't call up and say, hey, do you have any donor advice funds who are interested in you know, left-handed girls from Los Osos? Like, we're not <laughs> gonna get into the specificity of, of that, um, but just know that your application doesn't just, um, isn't just for that one program. Um, and then finally, uh, we are working with a number of private family foundations as well and bringing them together uh, to be able to support some of your programs. So some of you may, may just get a call from us one day saying, hey, we've got a, a private family foundation who's interested in X, Y, Z. What have you got? What kind of services are you providing uh, for those folks? And I think that's um, a very important, important role uh, as well. So I think now I'm gonna turn it over to Cassandra. Um, and, oh no, I guess I have to talk about disaster support, sorry. Um, so does that, this is our disaster support fund. This is who, mostly who we've supported. Um, uh, this slide doesn't have everybody on it, uh, but so far to date we've um, awarded $346,000 to local nonprofits and all of that in the last four months. So we, we've been pretty busy um, on our side of the fence trying to get um, disaster support funding out. Uh, as quickly as we can. We actually review grant applications every week. So if you'd like to, um, if you're addressing very vulnerable populations, um, then you should consider applying to the disaster support. And all of this is, you can, you can find it on our, um, on our website. And we've received almost half a million dollars for the disaster support fund. So we're, it's a, a very active, uh, active environment uh, right now. Okay, Cassandra, now do I turn it over to you? Now I will take the baton. Thank you, Heidi. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> awesome. And thank you to everybody on this call too for giving up part of your afternoon to tune in. Um, and I'm hoping that this will be an interesting conversation and a vibrant one at that. So while I start talking about the two different grant programs that are available in the fall, I would love to encourage questions. My only caveat to you asking questions, there's two. One, um, because I'm sharing my screen and the way it's set up, if you type in the chat box, I can't see it. So if you have a question, just ask. The second caveat though, is that if you do have a question, if you could try and keep it the question broad, so that everybody can uh, benefit from the question that you're asking, that would be great. And if you have any specific uh, questions about your organization and qualification and different things like that, feel free to drop me a line or shoot me an email after this and we can talk about that. But I'm hoping that during the course of the conversation, you'll have a good sense of our grant priorities and where we're pivoting. So I'm gonna spend quite a bit of time talking about health and wellness grants. I, I took a look at who had registered to attend and I listened to uh, what you all had said you were hoping to learn. So I'm gonna focus a lot of energy there, but I'll also be talking about our built small grants program as well. So uh, I wanted to give a quick update. In a watershed moment, our board of directors voted to allocate an additional half million dollars towards our grant making to support grants for this upcoming fall and spring. So the Health and Wellness Grants Program uh, has an additional $100,000 to award this year. So we'll have $200,000 that we're awarding. And then with the bump from our board of directors, we'll also have an additional $100,000 for our Build Small Grants Program. So that's pretty exciting. Um, we also know that the need is really high. And so while it's exciting, we also know that um, there's a, a, just an incredible amount of need out there. Uh, so I wanted to start about what we're learning and um, our continued process of um, listening to the community as well. 
So as a foundation, our health and wellness grants have always been used, um, or we've always used data to drive our decision making. And this is something that we really pride ourselves in is we use local data to make the priorities and that's how we do our funding. And this year when we were taking a look at our funding priorities and um, the research that we've had done in the past, it felt a little distant from the need of the community now because of COVID-19 which doesn't mean that whatever inequities happened before COVID-19 no longer exist. In fact, we know that those have been exasperated, but we wanted to circle um, back with grantees who have received uh, a grant from the health and wellness grant over the last five years to get a better sense for what you're experiencing both as nonprofits and then also in the clients that you're serving. So to do this, we formed a health and wellness uh, task force, which is comprised of board members, as well as members of our grants committee, which is a subcommittee of our board, to help us with this listening and to build the survey, and then also to help take stock of what we've learned and redraw our funding parameters. And in doing so, we considered, again, the client need, what organizations are experiencing at this time, and really looked at the intersection of uh, all of those things and where and how the foundation can help. So I thought it would be interesting to share with you a couple of the things that we saw amongst those um, of the folks that completed the survey. So uh, of the people who were sent the survey, again, they were past grantees of this grant program over the last five years. We received about a 50% response rate. And uh, about the demographic of those who completed the survey, those that had completed had an operational budget of over 800,000. So these were organizations or nonprofits that were significantly larger than our um, demographic of nonprofits throughout our county. So most of um, the nonprofits within our county have an operational budget of well under 500,000. So these were um, some of the larger organizations who had completed. So just want to share that as a caveat as we're looking at this data, um, but I'm hoping that it holds true for a lot of you as well. Um, what's interesting about this slide is that we see that there was an, ex that um, nonprofits said that they had an experience decrease in the demand at about 54% and then also had an experienced an increase in demand at 70%. And so when we were looking at this, we were once confounded of how does this happen where you're decreasing and increasing, and then we dug in a little bit deeper and started asking more questions. And so what we learned is that this actually shows a high level of adaptability and responsiveness to nonprofits in this incredibly fluid environment. So you all were experiencing a decrease in some areas of um, what you're serving your clients with while other components had had an increase. And so that's what we saw. And so we saw that this would have meant an incredible amount of fluidity in um, your organization and um, a real adaptability to be able to meet those needs of clients as well. We also took a look and asked nonprofits um, what were the most pressing or unmet needs of your clients currently? And they really fell into three categories. Um, basic needs, which was food, cash assistance. Um, other was really um, more cash assistance, but it was more specific. So other, um, the people who responded to the survey typed in things like gas cards and different things like that. We also saw that there was a need for services, for mental health services, and applying for federal, state, and county aid, um, as well as needing more um, PPE equipment. So those are some of the things that we had learned. And we also were interested in how nonprofits were faring too. Um, so we had asked how things were going, and we saw that there was definitely um, reduced staffing uh, in total, about 73% had experienced reduced capacity in staff and volunteer absences. 
So as grant makers, we had to start thinking about what does this mean in the way that we offer our grant making to be responsive to these huge shifts that have been experienced. Interestingly, and again, with the caveat of this population that completed the survey, having an organizational budget over 800,000, what was interesting is that despite having reduced staffing, most believed that they could stay in operations under current conditions um, for at least the next six months. So that was um, interesting as well. Um, and then we also asked what type of external supports, and so this kind of hits more on to build as we're thinking about that. Um, what type of external supports would you need to help with recovery? And most uh, folks said that they needed help with financial planning and development and fundraising, as well as strategic planning. So those were the areas that organizations had identified as needing um, some extra help at this point um, for stabilizing their organization. So those are just a quick snapshot of what we learned from that survey. Are there any questions before I jump into how that influenced our grant making? Okay, I'll go ahead and keep on going. But remember, you can interrupt me and ask questions. I encourage it. So again, um, because of what we were learning in the community and what we were um, hearing, we were able to have our board increase the amount of grant funding available for the next, um, for this upcoming fall and for the spring. Uh, one of the things that's really exciting is for our health and wellness grants, all grant funding through this grant round is going to be for general operating support. So we recognize when we looked at this slide right here, that there is a lot happening right now and it's an incredibly fluid environment. And so if we were to put out funding for project support right now, um, that might actually be more hurtful than it is helpful. So that's one of the reasons why we're offering um, general operating support. So with the idea that um, you're showing that you're incredibly flexible and adaptive to the community needs and we need to be too. So we've switched all of our grant funding to general operating support for health and wellness grants. Um, and then the build grants um, have increased capacity to do grant making, seeing as there's a lot of need for external supports at this time as well. So the big question is who can apply? So uh, what's really great about this is all of this funding is local and it's meant to support local organizations as well. So you must be a 501c3 tax exempt organization in San Luis Obispo County or benefiting residents within San Luis Obispo County. We also will accept fiscal sponsorships. So this happens when there's um, community members that are wanting to do something positive in the community. They partner with a 501c3 and they have a formal MOU outlining this type of fiscal sponsorship. So essentially the 501c3 applies on behalf of this um, grassroots um, group of neighbors wanting to help. And the 501c3 becomes our grantee and the 501c3 redistributes grant making to the people who are on the ground wanting to do that work. So we will accept grant funding for that as well, or we will provide grant funding for that as well. We have a whole list of exclusions on our website on who is not eligible for funding. And I would encourage you to take a look at that. I thought I would just highlight a couple of things that we will not be supporting. Um, one, because it's relevant to the time that we're in, is that we will not be supporting organizations uh, or programs designed to help elect candidates or public officials, so we're not doing that. Um, and then we also will not support organizations that discriminate based on age, disability, ethnic origin, gender, sexual orientation, gender identity, race or religion. Uh, and then we also won't support organizations who have no roots here in San Luis Obispo County, so they aren't benefiting our residents and are not of the community. 
So that's the, the Cliff Notes version on who's not eligible for funding. But again, we have a list that's published on our website. So if you want to dig into that, um, you're more than welcome to take a look. So for our 2020 Health and Wellness Grant Program, this very first paragraph on your screen um, is the same as it is in years prior. So our grant funding is to help mitigate and prevent adverse health outcomes. So through that lens, based off of what we learned from the community, we developed our funding priorities. And we have four priorities that are listed here. So we're, we learned that clients need access to basic needs, social services, and physical and mental health is top of mind. Given the fact that we are in a pandemic right now, we're also highly supportive of collaboration None of us can do this alone. If we come together, we can achieve more. So within that spirit, we're supporting collaborations for basic needs, social services, and physical and mental health. So you must be able to address one or more of the following in order to be eligible for grant funding. Uh, grant funding is available for one year. So one of the things that we learned from the survey is that um, there was an ask for funding to be multi-year. And just for the sake of transparency, we opted to go with general operating support over multi-year funding because it is a fluid environment. And we wanted to make sure that we would also have the ability to be adaptive and responsive to community needs as things continue to change. So we're opting for one-year grants. The grants will be up to $25,000 each, which is a large um, change from the grant size before. The largest grant size that we've given out through this program in the past is $15,000. So this year, they'll be up to $25,000. And I added the caveat of um, the average grant amount will typically be around the $10,000 um, range. So um, a lot of times people ask for how much they should make the ask. And my recommendation to you would be to ask for what you need. Um, and then some magic happens in committee where we're taking a look at what we can fund based off of the number of applications that we receive and the competitive nature of that, but ask for what you need in the application. So then I'll just quickly go over the application components. So one of the things that we shifted with the disaster support fund, if you had a chance to take a look at that application or apply to it, is that the disaster support fund is an incredibly abbreviated application. So we have two questions. Uh, what are you doing and how are you helping um, those that meet our funding priorities? And then um, tell us how you would use the money. So it's very simple um, and it's a quick application to complete. Normally, our grant, grants that we offer at the foundation um, have a more lengthy application, uh, and they really go soup to nuts on the organization and allow us to get to know you a little bit better that way. And so with this grant round, we decided to strike a balance in between. So it's a shorter application, so we're hoping that it will use less of your staff time and that you can use your time to work on other things because um, hopefully this isn't the thing that you're spending weeks on and working on. So we want um, nonprofit leaders to continue to be able to work in the field and to be able to deliver to your clients and have our application be simple. So our application um, is comprised of four different components. So these are the questions within the application. I thought what I would do is just highlight a couple of the different ways that your answers to these questions will be evaluated for the sake of transparency and also to help you with your application be more competitive. So with the first question, uh, really what we're looking for is that the summary is clearly written and that the purpose is in alignment with our funding priorities. So that is really what we're going to be looking for within that first question there. The second question, we're looking for alignment with your organization's mission and our funding priorities. 
So we don't want to partner with organizations who are bending themselves into a pretzel in order to get our funding. We want to make sure that this is a natural fit and that it's helpful funding, not hurtful funding to your organization. Um, we also will be taking a look at does this funding have the ability to leverage existing resources or collaboration? It doesn't mean that you won't get funded if it doesn't have that ability, but that is something that we'll be taking a look at. And then we'll also be taking a look at the organization's ability and um, understanding of their clients' needs and their ability to efficiently respond to those needs as well. For the third question, which is describe how COVID-19 has impacted the clients you serve and how your organization has responded or intends to respond to those needs, I wanted to add this caveat. One of the things that we continue to learn is that clients' access to health services or mental health services has really varied over time, especially with physical health. Uh, and so we know what this means is that there's probably going to be a huge upswell in the amount of clients needing support. Um, and so it, it can kind of feel like it's waiting for the storm. And so we want to make sure that we are supporting organizations' ability to respond to those needs if they're here or, or if you're expecting them to come in. Um, and then we also ask in the budget narrative to include the impact of COVID-19 on the organization's ability to serve clients. Um, and so we want to get a better sense for the organization, what um, your ability to efficiently use the funds and the level of planning or anticipation um, of the organizational's priorities during this as well. So really what we're looking in the budget narrative is even though we're funding general operating support, we want to have a good sense for how this funding is likely to be used. So um, that's something that I think is going to be really key to the reviewers is although we're supporting the organization, we want to see a plan for, okay, this is the pressing need that we see at this time and this is how we're likely to um, use this funding. But because it's general operating support, once funded, you have the flexibility to use the funding however your organization needs. So again, this could be the, a great plan for the first three months. Then who knows with COVID-19 or earthquakes or fires or however the world might change. And so this just allows for more flexibility. So you'll also be asked to submit a budget as well. And we'll be taking a look at that budget to get a sense. So um, again, even though it's for general operating support, it's really helpful and it will make your application so much more competitive if you're able to articulate the likelihood that this will go to X, Y, and Z. So we know it will shift, but just being able to understand and ride that wave with you of what you're thinking the funding will go towards will help it be more eligible. One of the attachments that's new to our grants is that we have also asked for a list of funding as a result of state and federal grants. Um, and you can also include any loss funding too as well. So that is the health and wellness grant side. I'm gonna pivot into the BUILDS grant program unless there's any questions on health and wellness. So Sandra, I have a quick question. This is uh, Michael Kaplan. Um, Given that you're looking for a degree of specificity in the budget narrative, and even in, in the first question um, on how we're going to spend the money, um, what is the general feeling about descriptions that start to feel more like a program grant than general operations, simply because we're getting deeper into the specifics of how we would spend the money? Do you see that as a problem? for those who are gonna be evaluating the grants? I think that that lens of applying, of thinking like towards this program, the funding might go, is the, probably the best way to be competitive because it's a paradigm shift for our committee to go to looking at just the organization and supporting just the organization. 
So going into details of what the organization's experiencing and drawing an alignment there probably will lend itself to a more competitive application. However, it is for general operating support. So once you receive the grant, general operating support. But I think that um, that bifurcation that you're pulling on of general operating support versus program um, request is very key. Um, I noticed this with um, the disaster support fund, that this is something, even though those grants are for general operating support, it's something that our committee also dug into is wanting some specificity of, well, how are they helping clients? What does this mean? But then once granted, it's for general operating support. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does, thank you. Yeah, good question. Any other questions before I move on to the build grant program? Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and move on. Please don't be um, strangers, ask away if questions come up. So we also have the build grant program. And this program has gone unchanged if you're familiar with it, with one exception, that the grant amount has increased from $5,000 to $10,000. So the BUILD grant program is a wonderful grant program. It's aimed at focusing on strengthening smaller nonprofits in our community. So agencies must have a budget of under $500,000. Uh, and the, the grant can be used for capacity building. So this can be anything from capital improvements, such as fixing a part of the property, bathrooms, different things like that. Or it can be used for staff and board training development. Um, it can also be used for communications or donor engagement tools, as well as hardware. So a lot of us have moved to working remotely. And so this is something that this grant round would support is um, hardware, software, different things like that for organizations to be able to work more remotely. So the purpose of this grant really came out of a study that was done a few years ago when there was this rumor that there were thousands upon thousands of nonprofits within San Luis Obispo County uh, and so the foundation wanted to do a deeper dive on what does this mean? And it turns out that there were a lot of nonprofits in our community, but far less than what the rumor had been. And that the majority of nonprofits were smaller and needed some help getting um, some of the things that we talked about, capacity building, building a donor base and different things like that. So that is the purpose of this grant, is to provide that strategic leg up. These grants are on a 12-month cycle, and there's an eligibility piece with it um, that I think is really key. So current grantees are not eligible to apply. So if you've received a BUILD grant in the last 12 months, you're not eligible to apply for this funding. However, we will have build become available again in the spring and you'll be eligible for that. So since we increased the grant amount to $10,000, um, if you received a grant last spring, you wouldn't be eligible for this. But if you received the grant in the spring, you would be uh, eligible for next spring's grants. Is that about as clear as mud? Are we good? Hi, Cassandra. This is Lisa Fraser. I have a question. Yes. So it's uh, agencies with a budget of 500,000 and below. And my question is, um, if my organization is above that threshold, but we take on a new project that requires some capacity building that would serve the community, we're just housing the program and the program has actually got a $200,000 budget and we wanna use it for some um, uh, board development purposes. Would that qualify separate, even though my agency is over 500,000, but the project that we're taking on, we really need to, to uh, wrestle with and get behind it? And when the organization has its own 501c3 and is standing on its own, then it would be eligible for funding. Um, but if it doesn't have that it, and it's within the wing, it wouldn't be eligible at this time. But then when it, when it does have its own 501c3, it would be. Okay, thank you. 
You're welcome. So I, I worked for some organizations where um, there was a larger organization that had a bunch of 501c3s that were underneath it that had their own boards, but it was the larger organization taking care of some of the back house things, so admin, um, bookkeeping, and different things like that. So those types of organizations would be eligible. A question, Cassandra? Yeah. Um, is it when you receive the funds, the 12 month window, or is it the spring and fall? If you, for instance, received it spring 2019, you could not apply in fall 2019, or is it just when the date you receive the funds? Um, I would go based off of the grant cycle. So I'll add this little caveat as to why. So in the past, I might have said the opposite, but we're looking at bumping up our spring grant round so that way it takes place earlier in the year. And so I wouldn't want that weird timing to make it so people would be ineligible. We're looking at bumping up our spring grant cycle so that way we can get money out the door faster to nonprofits that need it right now. So more to come on that. Good question. Any other questions on this? Okay, so I thought what I would do is just add a couple of tips. Uh, for a successful application, and then I'll talk a little bit about our online grant application. Uh, so I'll just quick jump in here. So there's four things that I've noticed that our committees really take a look at, which is credibility of the applicant. So do the people who are applying have the experience and the capacity to carry out what they're saying they want to do? Um, we also take a look to see if good planning is evident within the application. Uh, one of the things that we talked about a little bit earlier is really wanting to make sure that we as the grant maker are a good match for what you're seeking to do. So that compatibility and making sure that you're not bending yourself into a pretzel or we're not in order to make it eligible. We want to be a do no harm funder. <laughs> Um, we also are taking a look to make sure that the budget reflects the organization's ability to respond and that if um, the organization is applying and saying that they're doing some kind of collaboration, we're going to look for some evidence of that um, collaboration. Um, and then we also are taking a look at if the problem is significant to both the organization and the constituents of those that you serve. So those are some of the different ways that we're analyzing the application, especially right now when we're looking at funding general operating support. As far as what makes a good application, uh, well-defined is key. So I noticed this in our spring grant cycle that sometimes it was difficult to understand what was being asked within the application until we got to the budget. And then we had that like, oh, moment. So it's really helpful if within the narrative that you're articulating um, what it is that you're seeking funding for. And it's so clear that we don't have to look to the budget to have that drive um, what the funding's for. Um, the unmet need um, has a broad reach. And um, I actually want to double click on that based off of a question that was at the beginning. So there's two things that we take a look at. So number of people served is one way to take a look at a grant and go, okay, this is gonna serve a large number of people and um, that is good. It's also in direct tension with another thing that's really important, which is a lower number of applicants or, or people served, but they're served in a, a very meaningful way. So we take a look at both. So we're not um, a massive or a tiny population. We're really looking at both and um, making decisions accordingly. Uh, we're also looking at, is it grounded in reality? So is there a track record to say that the organization can do it? Um, does it seem like it can actually get itself off the ground? Those are the types we're looking at. And then we're also taking a look at the organization's ability and expertise to carry out whatever it is that they're seeking to do. So um, an example in the past um, at a different foundation that I worked at is there was a group that was wanting to do something that seemed like it was on the lines of therapy, although 
we couldn't tell in the application if the organization had the expertise to give out that kind of services. And so the application wasn't as competitive because they didn't talk about their credentials and why they're best positioned to carry out that work. So those are the types of things that I think uh, a very competitive application will include. So I just wanted to quick highlight those. And then I thought I would talk about our application portal. But before I do that, I just want to make sure that there aren't any questions about anything that I just said. Okay, so I'll jump into the portal. So I took a couple of screenshots. Um, essentially, there's four different components of our application. You'll notice that when it's complete, it will say 100%. So if you complete all the sections and don't submit, your application won't be received by us. So when you complete your application, you should get an auto response email that says your application has been received. If you do not receive this email, please contact me immediately because it would be horrible for you to do all this work and then be missing one component and the application to not be seen by the committee. So expect to receive uh, an auto reply email when you push submit. There's four different components to the application. So the first is the applicant information. Um, this is really basic information. If there's been turnover at your organization and the person who used to complete the grant is no longer there, we can help link your application for you so that way you can have access to prior applications that were submitted. Um, so just let us know if that's something that you need and you can just send me an email and we'll um, accommodate for that. We also have the program narrative and we went into depth for that for um, the health and wellness grants but that's a component of this as well. And then all of your required attachments. I highly recommend when you start the application, clicking over to the required attachments early because a lot of these pieces are probably things that you already have on hand, but it's good to have them first instead of having to wait on a colleague to get a component of it or a board member. So I would click over to the required attachments first just to make sure you have all your ducks in a row and are communicating with the proper channels on your end. And then we also have our terms and conditions statement, which just um, is a, essentially a contract between us and you that if you receive the grant funding that you'll abide by our terms and conditions. So again, I just wanted to go a little bit deep into the program narrative. Um, I know that for some people on this call, this might sound a little bit remedial, especially if you're a grant writer. Um, well, as for other folks on the call, this might be the very first grant that you write. And so I want to make sure that I'm giving you all the tools that you need to be successful. So with the program narrative, uh, what I would really make sure to do is to avoid any technical jargon or language. So the people who review these grants are community volunteers. Some of them are from the field and some of them are not. And so when you're shaping your program narrative, I think it can be really helpful to think about it in terms of I had a bunch of friends over at my house for dinner and I was talking about my organization and how great it is and what we're wanting to do. It's that almost that level of informality and avoiding jargon that is really helpful. And I've noticed that um, interestingly, it's our larger organizations that um, use a little bit more jargon. So I would just highly recommend having it be more conversational in tone. Um, and, I think, and I think that can be helpful. Um, one thing that might be good too is to have someone, especially if you haven't written um, a grant before, someone who's not familiar with your organization at all uh, be your proofreader because they might be able to ask questions that our committee is likely to ask if we haven't um, had a grant application from you in the past. So um, those are my suggestions for the narrative, um, which takes me to my last slide which is um, our deadline here is October 1st at 5 p.m. for all of our grants. Uh, and if you have any questions, always feel free to give me a call or send me an email. Because of COVID, I'm a little bit faster to return emails than I am phone calls because I'm working in multiple places right now. Um, 
but I, I hope that this was helpful and please feel free to ask questions if you have any. Cassandra, this is Lo with PathPoint. I do have a question on the deadline. Um, we usually apply for the community needs grants in March. And so I'm sorry if I missed this link, but is this replacing the community needs grants and, and the deadline is in October? Or are you still gonna have that in the spring? So we have two different grants that happen. So we have our fall grants and our spring grants. So our spring grants are the community needs ones that you're talking about. Um, and then these are our fall. So these are not replacing what we normally do in the spring. Um, what I will say though, is we're taking a look at bumping up our spring timeline. So they may become available sooner in this calendar year. And if that happens, I'll send out an email, but those grants, do not have anything to do with these. So I'm sorry, I'm, I haven't been to one of these meetings before, so I'm just, I need more clarification. With um, the two different cycles, can an organization only apply for one? Or what if we're eligible under both the fall and the spring cycle? So the health and wellness grants are only available once a year and they're available in the fall. So you don't have to worry about applying more than once because they're only available once. Uh, for the build grants, if you receive grant funding for the fall, then you're not eligible for the spring grant cycle. I'm sorry, just to clarify, um, we were awarded in the spring for the community needs grants. Can we apply in October for the health and wellness grant grants or are we ineligible because we already received? Absolutely. The only one that you wouldn't be able to apply twice for is the build grant. Yeah. Sandra, okay, thank you. The, the deadline is October 1st. When do you announce who, who receives the grants? At the end of December. December. Okay. Mm -hmm. Good question. Any other questions? Okay, well, thank you all so, so much for joining me on this call. And if you have any questions, please always feel free to send me an email. And I look forward to connecting with you. Thank you all so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.